In 1 uh, Kings 16:16, 16, 16, <clears throat> the people who were camped heard it and <clears throat> said, Zimri has conspired and has also struck down the king. Therefore, all Israel made Omri, the commander of the army, king over Israel that day in the camp. That's going to take a little bit of background to make that one make any sense, okay? <clears throat> but it's a uh, you know, pretty powerful section of scripture. And really, this whole section we're going to talk about today, I guess, I guess if I was going to put a title on today, it'd be <clears throat> The Decline of the House of Omri, okay? And we've got to go back to uh, 1 Kings chapter 11 here to kind of get some background on this, kind of work through some things today, and uh, show you how really things went on a downhill slide in a major way. In, in 1 Kings chapter 11, it talks about King Solomon. Now, Ke Solomon, along with David and, and King Saul, were the only three kings of a united Israel. And uh, Solomon was the, the last king where all Israel was together as one, one united country. Solomon, um, in verse 1, 1 uh, Kings 11, 1, says, Solomon loved many foreign women, along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, Hittite, women concerning, or from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the sons of Israel, you shall not associate with them, for they shall surely turn your heart away from after their gods. And Solomon held fast to these in love, and he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned his heart away. I mean, I mean, this guy's in trouble, you know, I mean, uh, for, for being the, the wisest guy, you know, it was, he sure wasn't much with women, you know, he just, I mean, 700 wives and 300 concubines, I mean, I've always maintained one woman is more than enough for one man, more than enough, you know, and uh, so... But here's a key line here. It says, For when Solomon was old, his wives turned his heart away after other gods. And his heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord his God, as the heart of David his father had been. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the detestable idol of the Ammonites. And Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and did not follow the Lord fully, as David his father had done. Then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the detestable idol of Moab, on the mountain which is east of Jerusalem, for Moloch, the detestable idol of the sons of Ammon. Thus he did for all his foreign wives who burned incense and sacrificed to their gods. Now what we've got to remember is, is God's long war is against idolatry, you know, the worship of idols, and uh, whatever form they take. And uh, it's subtle, as we've talked before, you know, most people will not worship Satan directly. I mean, there's a few Satan worshipers out there, uh, but for the most part, most people won't do that. So Satan has to get worship indirectly, and he does that through idols. And the New Testament lets us know that behind every idol is some sort of demonic force. There's something, you know, demonic working in the minds of men, you know, that would get them to worship an idol. I mean, both Isaiah and Jeremiah, the prophets, they, they laugh at these guys that make idols. You know, they talk about, okay, you go down, out to the woods, you cut down a tree, you know, you cut it up in chunks. Part of it you use as firewood. You know, part of it you carve into a chair for furniture. And part of it, you, you work really hard, you make an idol, you, you get the bottom all flat so it doesn't totter. Maybe you cover it with metal. And after you get through building that thing, you fall down before it and say, save me, my God. You know, see, what, what would take, get people's minds so that they can't make the connection between something that's gold or silver or stone or wood and, and, and realize there's no power in that. But see, Satan's very good at, uh, at working. The demonic forces are very good at getting people over to where they're, they're worshiping something. Um, mankind is, is fundamentally religious, whether they like to admit it or not. And sooner or later, you know, they're going to pin their hopes on something. You know, for example, in, in Western civilization, you know, there's, we, you know, Western civilization began with uh, freshly printed, printed copies of the Bible in the hands of the language of common people, okay? Um, but see, as Western civilization has rejected God, you know, by, by turning away from the Bible, they're subtly backing into the arms of the East, see, where you get meditation and yoga and see all that kind of stuff. See, it's, uh, 
See, man is, is fundamentally religious, uh, whether he realizes it or not. But Satan's the deceiver. So anything connected with why idol worship is based on a deception. Like I say, how are you going to think that something that you just built is going to save you? You know, if you, if you put those pieces together in your brain, you wouldn't think like that. But that's, that's how Satan is able to get inside people's skulls. So Solomon was a victim of that. You know, his wives got to working on him, and so all of a sudden now he's worshiping all these other gods. You think God's going to be happy with that? So again, this, this, uh, this stuff is recorded uh, for our benefit, and there's a lot of archaeological stuff, you know, back in the, you know, they not too long ago, they found the palace of King David in Jerusalem. And some of these other places we're going to look at, yep, they're there. So Solomon goes bad, so... God would have taken the kingdom away from him, but for the sake of David, his servant, he wasn't going to do that until Solomon's dead. So when Solomon is dead, then along comes his son, uh, Rehoboam, and I guess I would call him Rehoboam the knucklehead. I mean, I don't know what else to call this guy. Uh, okay, the, the people come to him and they want to know, what are you going to do? Uh, are you going to raise taxes? I mean, what about the the tax and regulatory burden we're carrying here. What are you going to do with that? And Rehoboam's older counselor said, look it, back off those taxes, back off those regulatory burdens. Be a servant to the people, they'll serve you. But Rehoboam says, okay, what are you younger guys that I grew up with? What, what do you guys think? They said, well, you got to show them who's king. You know, you go back and tell them that, you know, your, your little finger is... Is, is, you know, thicker than, than your father's loins. I mean, you, you talk about regulatory and taxation burdens before, now you're going to really get it. Okay? Well, the people rebelled. And so now we're split. We've got two nations. We've got Judah in the south with its capital still at Jerusalem. Now we've got the one that retains the name, name Israel in the north. Okay? And so we're going to follow that history a little bit of the nation in the north and see what happens. So, as soon as uh, uh, the rebellion takes place, there's a guy by the name of Jeroboam. And uh, Jeroboam's going to become king of the northern nation Israel, right? And uh, so he's got a problem. In 1 Kings chapter 12, in verse 26, 1 Kings 12, 26, Jeroboam said in his heart, Now the kingdom will return to the house of David. See, I just got this brand new Israel kingdom here. I'm the brand new king, got a chance to start my own dynasty. I'm Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. <laughs> I got a good thing going here. But the kingdom will return to the house of David here. So if the people, in verse 27, go up to offer sacrifices in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then the heart of this people will return to their Lord, even to Rehoboam, king of Judah. And they'll kill me and return to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Now, a prophet had actually spoken to Jeroboam earlier and said, Look, if you'll walk in the ways of the Lord, the Lord will secure your, your kingdom for you and those after you. Okay? But see, you can see Jeroboam got no trust in that at all. No trust in what God said. That's always the problem, is no trust in what God said. Okay? So, so the king consulted there in verse 28 and made two golden calves. And he said to the people of Israel, he said, It's too much to you to go up to Jerusalem. <clears throat> Behold your gods, O Israel, that brought you up from the land of Egypt. And he set one at Bethel in the south, and one the other he put at Dan in the north. Okay. So, let's see. So it's going to take him back to when, who brought him out of the land of Egypt. Now, see, what's hard for us to process here is the length of time. Uh, Moses led Israel out of Egypt in the year 1446 B.C. And you can actually calculate that. And if you go back to uh, 1 Kings chapter 4, you get a description of the, uh, or excuse me, 1 Kings chapter 6, you get a description of the building of the temple of the Lord. 1 Kings 6, 1 <clears throat> says that now it came about in the 480th year after the sons of Israel came out of the land of Egypt in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month of Ziv, which is the second month, that he began to build the house of the Lord. <clears throat> and you can actually use a solar eclipse that took place in Nineveh uh, in the year 736 B.C., and you can use that eclipse to actually figure the dates on all these things. So we know that Solomon began to reign in 970 B.C., and so in 966 
is when he started to build the temple. And if you backtrack 480 years from that, you get the year 1446, which is the year they left Egypt. Okay? And, of course, Solomon reigns 40 years. <coughs> so we know that uh, Jeroboam <coughs> is doing these things in, in uh, 900 and uh, about 30 B.C. Okay? So we're looking, you know, well over 500 years here of lapse. Now look at how, how much people forget in 500 years. See, for us, it's the Bible. Okay, so here we go, Bible, 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 Bible. And it's all there. Okay, but, but think of our own country here just as an illustration. <clears throat> we're less than 250 years since 1776. You know, we're coming up on that anniversary in, in uh, 2026, but... Uh, 250 years. Let's see, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, so, okay, how much do we forget? I mean, what's the Constitution? You know, we do ordain to ourselves and our posterity the blessings of liberty. <clears throat> so they said, Uncle Sam, this is what you can do. Uncle Sam, this is what you can't do. So right now, you see, you're seeing an issue where the federal government wants to evolve itself in the reconstituting and regulation of the local police force, right? Okay, is that constitutional? You know, <clears throat> in the words of Nancy Pelosi when she was talking about o o Obamacare, are you serious? You know, to bring the Constitution in? My point is, is people forget. You know, Germany, <clears throat> Germany had local police. I pronounce it the best I can. I think it was Volkspolizei. <clears throat> um, you never heard of the Volkspolizei. And then under Hitler, they got a national police, the Gestapo. See, you heard of the Gestapo. And see, that's what's happening in America. They're trying to dismantle the local police and set up a Gestapo. Now they're not going to call it the Gestapo, but that's what's going on because people forgot. They forgot the Constitution. They forgot the principles. They forgot the basis of the American Revolution. That's just an illustration, see, what's happened to Israel here in the 500 years of their history. People forget. They, they, they lose the importance. They, they don't process. And so here's old Jeroboam. He says, you know what? It's too difficult for you guys to go to Jerusalem. So here's a golden calf and here's a golden calf. And what do you know? These are the gods that brought you up out of the land of Egypt. People forget. Forget. How, how could he sell that? Well, he did. Sold it. And one of the points that I'm making here in uh, my presentation today, that when things come from the top down, they're hard to stop. When they come from the top down, they're hard. See, when Jeroboam says, okay, these are the gods, see, now the whole nation Israel is plunged into idolatry. God loses instantaneously 80% of his work. 80% of his work, gone, just like that. As 10 of the 12 tribes go directly into idolatry. See, when you recognize that this is God's war here against idolatry, you realize how intense and how serious this warfare is. Okay. So Jeroboam, you know, he, he gets the golden calves going. And, you know, how he sold it to the people, you know what? Too difficult for you guys to go that extra 15, 20 miles from Bethel to Jerusalem. Too, too difficult. We're making it easy for you. It's going to make it easy for you. So just, just come to Bethel. Or actually, we've got another one up north. You don't want to go south. You know, we got one in the north for you, too. So <clears throat> easy, right? Uh, is easy always right? Uh, the answer to that question is generally no. <laughs> okay. You know, there's the right way and then there's the easy way is what it usually boils down to. Okay. So Israel is now plunged into idolatry. And uh, so, you know, because of that, God's not happy. So he wipes out the, the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. And then you get uh, uh, a guy by the name of Baash that comes up. And, uh, and so that's kind of what's going on here in 1 Kings 16. In verse 8, 1 Kings I mean, this, this thing is, see, once Israel went into idolatry, nothing but anarchy and chaos and revolution and killing and conspiracies and everything else. It's just a disaster. And one of the things that God's doing is he's recording these things for our benefit. 
You know, I mean, it was George Santayana, I think, that said that those who will learn nothing from history are condemned to repeat it. See, well, God recorded this history, and you know, this one's accurate. You know, other, every other history, you know, you always got to read it with one eyebrow raised because it, there's always some prejudice, human prejudice in the authorship. This one is God's perspective. See, he's, he steps back from the human race. He says, okay, I'm going to tell you. This is how it was. And it's recorded, so we might learn. You know, 1 Kings 16, 8. See, in the 26th year of Asa, king of Judah, Elah, the son of Baasha, became king over Israel at Terzah, and he reigned two years. Before very long, Terzah was the capital of uh, the northern kingdom. And again, you can go online, and you'll be able to see the ruins of Terzah. I mean, it's an actual city. It was there, and they've excavated it, found some palaces and stuff in there. It's all there, okay? And uh, now his servant... Okay, Elah reigned two years. This isn't sounding good, is it? Okay. And his servant Zimri, commander of half of his chariots, conspired against him. Now he, that's Elah, uh, was at Terza drinking himself drunk in the house of Arza, who was over the household at Terza. Okay. Um, probably wasn't a smart plan, was it? Then Zimri went in and struck him and put him to death in the 27th year of Asa, king of Judah, and became king in his place. It came about when he became king, as soon as he sat on his throne, that he killed all the household of Baasha, did not leave a single male, neither of his relatives nor of his friends. Okay. See, generally that's how it is in, in most countries. I mean, when the new ruler takes over, everybody who was the previous administration, they're gone. They're dead, executed. Why? Because they're a threat. Um, see, the, both the American Revolution and you know, what uh, Lincoln called the war between the states have been very unusual. Because after the American Revolution, you know, the patriots didn't go around trying to kill all the Tories. See? Or after the, you know, the war between the states, um, you know, all the northerners didn't try to kill all the southerners. See, there's, there was a recognition here. You know, that was in the statues. The reason that those statues have been there for more than 100 years, there was an attempt by both the North and the South to pull things back together and to be one country, one unit. See, the, the, the Civil War was not over slavery. The Civil War was over tariffs that the guys in the votes in the North had the votes to impose so that the South had to buy their goods and services at a much higher price than they could get from England. That's what the Civil War was over. Anybody would go back in history would know that. See, all this stuff gets twisted. And uh, so it's unusual because they didn't try to destroy, you know, the opposition after it was over. Here, you're seeing, you know, once that previous king is down, all the friends, all the relatives, gone, dead, okay? So in uh, verse 12, it says, Thus Zimri destroyed all the household of Baasha. See, so we got... All the descendants of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, they're gone. Now Baasha, all his are gone. And God said it was going to happen. According to the word of the Lord, which he spoke against Baasha through Jeho the prophet, for all the sins of Baasha and the sins of Elah his son, which they sinned and which they made Israel sin, provoking the Lord God to, of Israel to anger with their idols. See, this idol thing, that's, a, <clears throat> that's the problem. How is it Satan's able to get inside people's skulls enough that a whole nation goes into idol worship? Now all the rest of the acts of Elah and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of Kings of Israel? See, that history was there. Now, in the 27th year of Asa, king of Judah, Zimri reigned seven days. Okay, seven days? <coughs> in Ter at Terza. Okay, I mean, obviously we got a lot of anarchy, a lot of confusion going on. A lot of political ambition, right? A lot of political ambition. You know, whenever there's money and power and influence, there's somebody going after it. And if you're in the way, you could be a dead body. You know, Philippines politics is like that. One of the guys that we ended up studying with was pretty well connected with, uh, you know, the political figures in, uh, in his area. And uh, his dad was very influential in, in his particular province. And he was running for some election to some high authority. And he's coming down the road, and uh, you know, a big tr dump truck ran over him. You know, 
And what was interesting is, you know, when they finally got the body out of the dump truck, <coughs> there was also um, an arrow through him. I guess somebody wanted him dead, right? That's never happened in American history, but, you know, it's in, in places like the Philippines, see, where they, you got this tremendous drive for power, see. Zimri rent lasts seven days, okay? Now, the people were camped against Gibeathan, which belonged to the Philistines. And the fe people who were camped heard it. See, this is an army, in other words. They said, Zimri has conspired, has also struck down the king. Therefore, all Israel made Omri, the commander of the army, king over Israel, that day. Oh, that's the verse we read, wasn't it? Then Omri and all Israel with him went up to Gibbethon and besieged Tersia. When Zimri saw that the city was taken, he went into the citadel, the king's house, and burns the king's house over him with fire, and he died. Because of his sins, which he sinned, doing evil on the sight of the Lord, walking the way of Jeroboam, and his sin, which he did, making Israel sin. Now the rest of the acts of Zimri and his conspiracy, which he carried out, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel? So Z Zimri had a quick end, right? I mean, when he could see, when he could see maybe what he was going to face, if uh, Omri takes the king, the smart thing to do is just go into the palace and burn it over you, right? Rough. Okay. So Omri, step by step, then became the next king. Okay, he he eventually uh, was able to gain power. His rival actually died. So in verse 23. In uh, 1 Kings 16, in the 31st year of Asa, king of, of Judah, Omri became king over Israel, and he reigned 12 years, and he reigned 6 years at Terza. And he bought the hill Samaria from Shemer for two talents of silver, and he built on the hill and named the city uh, which he built uh, Samaria after the name of Shemer, the owner of the hill. And that's significant because that becomes now the capital of the northern nation. And over a period of years, Samaria is going to be an equivalent name for Israel. Ephraim, Samaria, Israel. And, of course, the Samaritan people, they continue to exist. They're, they're people in existence at the time of Jesus. You know, the parable of the Good Samaritan. See, so this is a key point in history when now Samaria becomes the, the new capital of the northern nation as this develops. Elmery, you know, he... He did evil, it says in verse 25. But um, it's son Ahab of the house of Omri that we want to focus on right now. Ahab and Jezebel. I mean, I mean, just even the name Jezebel still rings down, you know, uh, through the ages, right? In verse 29, it says, Ahab, the son of Omri, became king over Israel in the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, and Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria for 22 years. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. So, I mean, this thing is going down, isn't it? Verse 31, it came about as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he married Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, the king of Sidonians, and went to serve Baal and worshipped him. So he erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. Ahab also made the Asherah. Now, Baal is basically the Canaanite rain god. I mean, the fertility of the ground is always a big issue for all these people who's living. You know, they've got to get the crops out of the ground. You know, everything has to be done by hand. You know, I, I remember watching some of those big combine, you know, big 60-foot header <coughs> rolling through the grain fields, you know, and, and uh, one guy sitting there air-conditioned and listening to country music on the radio, rolling through the, the wheat field, doing 60 acres per day. You know, can you imagine what that would have been like, you know, out there having to hand scythe that, you know, and then shock it, let it dry, and then bring it in, whap the heads on, try to, try to get the wheat out of the heads. You, you're not... You know, you're not going to be farming 60 acres, much less doing 60 acres a day doing that. See, and again, Gary, you know, remembers, uh, you know, in the Philippines, <clears throat> that's how they do the rice, the farmers. You know, they have these little rice plots and they grow the rice and when it's dry, they pull it out of there. They, they basically shock it, let it dry. Then they have to stand there and they have to, they have a board and they have kind of a tarp or sheet underneath. They have to whap the heads 
<coughs> of the, the rice stalks and have the, the rice fall into the, the tarp. That's how they harvest the, the rice. A little hard for them to compete with the Louisiana guys. Again, they run a combine in there, <coughs> running over, you know, <coughs> 2,000 acre, you know, rice plantation or whatever. But <coughs> see, everything had to be done by hand, and so the ancients were always very interested in the fertility of the ground, and so they tended to have these gods, <coughs> like in this case, the rain god, and his female <coughs> counterpart, Ashtar. Uh, which is the really basically the female goddess of fertility. And uh, so the Asherah, Asherah was basically the place where Ashtar was worshipped. And they'd all have a sacred pillar there and everything. And you see that all the way through the Old Testament. <clears throat> God hates it. God hates it. You know, the, uh, <clears throat> and you know, they'll just talk about the horrid image of Ashtar or the Asherah. And uh, because they used male and female sex organs as a symbol. So that was, that's what those were. See, mankind, when they get a chance to go to the bottom, they go to the bottom as fast as they can get there. And so Israel is going to the bottom here, and it's getting pushed from the top. See, here comes Jezebel, <coughs> you know, sweet princess, you know, the king of, you know, daughter of Sidon. She comes in, and she... And decides that she wants to have Baal worship and she wants to have Asherah worship. And so we're going to do this, right? I mean, who was it that worked on Solomon? His wives. See, don't ever discount the power of women. You know what I mean? Pillow talk is powerful tough stuff, okay? And uh, so Jezebel, I mean, as bad as Ahab was. Jezebel, whew. So... <clears throat> Ahem, you know, built those things. So now <clears throat> things are going downhill. Chapter 17, <clears throat> God not going to let that go unanswered. <clears throat> Onto the stage steps Elijah the Tishbite. Okay, he's from Tishbe, one of the towns in Gilead, which is off on the east side of the Jordan. <clears throat> and he says to Ahab, see, I, how do these prophets get in there in the presence of the kings? I don't know. Because you see all the time, you know, the prophet said this and the prophet said that. <clears throat> so I don't know how, so here's Ahab, I don't know how he shows up, God opened the door for him or whatever, and he shows up in the presence of Ahab. Right there, it says, by the word of the Lord, <clears throat> as the Lord, the God of Israel is, before whom I stand, surely there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. <clears throat> you think you've seen drought before, you're going to get it. Now, who is it that controls the weather? Oh, I know, it's the jet stream. The jet stream, that's what does it, right? See, people forget, don't they? <clears throat> if God wants a little hurricane aimed right at <clears throat> New Orleans, guess what? <clears throat> he can do that. Yeah, I, I watch the Weather Channel every morning, um, you know, get my prophecy for the day. And... Uh, <clears throat> You know, it's, uh, in, in, it's interesting. See, they don't give God any credit at all. I think ABC took over the Weather Channel uh, some years ago, and so we're subjected to global warming propaganda all the time. But, uh, you know, God gets, gets no credit. Somebody was saying the other day, I thought it was interesting, you know, it said back when the 9-11 hit, there's all this stuff, God bless America and prayers for America. And uh, was, was it you was saying that, Sean? I was trying to remember. Yeah, Sean was saying it. And... Uh, all of a sudden, here we are, we got this massive uh, virus attack, and uh, who's, who, where's any reference to God in the public life? <clears throat> you know, I've got streets burning up. Where's the, where's the appeal to God? It's not there, is it? What happened? <clears throat> See, it comes from the top down, doesn't it? It comes from the top down. And the only question is whether the people are going to put up with it or not. So Elijah the Tishbite shows up. It's going to be drought. Not going to be any rain except by my word. Uh, by Mr. King because I know you're going to try to kill me. Okay. So he's gone for, for quite a while, a couple years. And uh, finally he has an audience with Ahab. You know, he sets it up just right. 
And so what he does is he challenges Ahab to have all the prophets of Baal meet him on Mount Carmel. Okay, Mount Carmel was a mountain that kind of juts out into the Mediterranean Sea. There's another very similar mountain to it in, in uh, California, along the California coast. Uh, they named it Mount Carmel, after the one in Israel. Similar type formation. Not too far from the old Spanish capital, Monterey. Okay. And uh, so, <clears throat> challenges them to, to a little duel up there. And so the prophets came together, and so the people together. In verse 20, 1 Kings 18, 20. Ahab sent a message uh, among all the sons of Israel and brought the prophets together at Mount Carmel. And Elijah came near to all the people. He said, how long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord, if Yahweh has God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. And the people being noncommittal. People saying nothing. Elijah said, I'm the only prophet left. There's 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophetess of Ashtar. Tell you what, let's have a little contest here. And uh, you guys, you prophets of Baal, you put your, 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 your animal for sacrifice. You put your bull there on the altar. And then uh, you have Baal answered by fire. The God who answers by fire, he's God, right? Okay, that, that, that's the contest. The God who answers by fire. So they did it. They agreed. I mean, Ahab called them together. Ahab said, hey, prophets of Baal, come on. I, mean, I agreed to this contest, so you guys got a show. In other words, no negotiation on this deal. I mean, they're, they're stuck. <clears throat> it put up or shut up. <clears throat> Ahab, you know, he kind of maybe believes there's some pro power in the prophets of Baal. I mean, how, how deeply is Ahab processing? Surface, you know, about that thin, right? <clears throat> Just processing really thin. And so, yeah, I guess, you know, yeah, contest, okay? <clears throat> so, of course, they, they got their bowl ready, you know, and they, they danced and bounced around and all that kind of stuff. Nothing happens. Elijah comes out and taunts them. Maybe your God's asleep. Maybe he's going to the bathroom. Maybe you know, on vacation, whatever. See, nothing happens. See, at the time then of the evening offering in Jerusalem, though, Elijah steps up. I mean, and, and the prophets of Baal, I mean, they're cutting themselves so that the blood's flowing and everything else. So that it's kind of like the, you know, pagans often do. They, if they get the blood flowing, somehow that's going <clears> to <throat> make more power for the gods. See, nothing happens. So Elijah steps up and gets his bull, builds an altar, you know, 12 stones, uncut stones from the ground, and gets the altar built. They put a bowl on it, soak it down with water pretty good. And then at the time of the evening offering, Elijah calls the fire down from heaven. And it comes down, burns up the bowl, burns up the wood, evaporates the water, evaporates the rocks. See, now what do the people say? Oh yeah, Yahweh, he is God, Yahweh, he is God, right? And so Elijah says, kill the prophets of Baal and kill those prophetesses of Ashtar. 450 prophets of Baal, 450 prophetesses dead. Okay. Then Elijah goes to the edge of Mount Carmel and he prays for rain. Six times with his head kind of down almost between his knees. And he looks up and he tells his servant, go out and see if there's anything. Nothing. Seventh time, lifts his head, tells the servant to go see. Yep, he says, there's a little cloud. No bigger than a man's hand coming. Elijah says, stand up. <clears throat> Tell Ahab he's going to be running his chariot in mud tonight. Sure enough, you know, here comes the storm and here comes the rain. Going to be no rain except by the word of Elijah. Three and a half years, no rain till Elijah prays. And so the Bible says that Elijah outran Ahab's chariot to Jezreel. That, that's over 30 miles. Okay. <laughs> Running in the rain. Here, here you got the hairy robe prophet out here. And he's in front of the chariot. He, he's running. 
30 plus miles in front of that chariot all the way to Jezreel. Okay. It was good, it was good life being a prophet, you know, just you know, no challenge, no nothing, right? Well, Jezebel, chapter 19, verse 1, says, Now Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, how he killed all the prophets, that's uh, of Baal with the sword. And Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me, and even more, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. Now, Elijah never ran from Ahab. But when Jezebel says, you're going to be dead, Elijah runs. Boy, sometimes you get some of these women with the... Whew, dangerous. So he ran. Ends up at Mount Sinai. God has a little chat with him. And... Uh, in verse four, uh, chapter 19, verse 14, when Elijah talks to God, he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. God said, uh-uh, I've kept 7,000 men who have not yet bowed the knee to Baal. 7, 000, that's not many. Some See, Elijah says, I'm the only guy left. God, no, no. I know something you don't. There's still 7,000. But that's a small percent. I mean, this country has gone downhill bad. Okay. And what follows then, you know, in the, in the history, it's, it's kind of interesting if you read through it. Eventually, Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah in the south, he comes up and he makes an alliance with Ahab. And this is bad because now Jehoshaphat's son marries one of Ahab's daughters trained by Jezebel. And so now the contagion that was in the north is now spreading to the south. And so that, that idol worship just really running rampant through God's people. This, this is a tremendous battle. And the scriptures recording these things so we might understand what a tremendous battle this is against idolatry. God's going to make sure that Ahab dies. You know, the situation is Ahab wants to buy this vineyard from a guy named uh, Naboth, a Jezreelite, and he, won't, he says, I can't sell it. It's his family's property. He's lorded by Lot clear back in the days of uh, Joshua. Can't sell it. Well, Ahab's mad, and he goes and pouts, and so Jezebel comes and says, what's wrong, honey? And he says, Naboth won't sell me the vineyard. She says, don't worry about it, honey. I'll take care of it. So she arranges a big banquet for Naboth, seats him at the head of the table, has a couple guys up there. In the middle of the banquet, these two guys jump up and said, Naboth cursed God and the king. So they killed him on the spot, right? See, when these guys are in power and they want something, a few dead bodies, what's that? It's called the cost of doing business. They don't concern about human life. It's cost of doing business. You know, black lives matter. What, what's the percentage of all the babies that are aborted that are black? But who thinks about that, right? I mean, you're not, you're not supposed to make those connections. So, <clears throat> Jezebel comes in and says, you can take your vineyard now. The little problems all taken care of, you know, dead. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, <clears throat> Ahab goes down to take possession of the vineyard, right? And guess who's there? Elijah, the Tishbite. <clears throat> and he says, you know what? Right here in this vineyard, <clears throat> said the, the dog's going to lick your blood. And furthermore, that little wife of yours, Jezebel, the dog's going to heat her body in Jezreel. Uh, prophets generally didn't live long. <laughs> okay. 
You know, they're talking to the kings like that, see. So, well, they go to war. Jehoshaphat and his men and, and uh, Ahab and his men, they go to war against Syria. And uh, so Ahab says, you know what, I'm going to outfox uh, the deal here. I'm going to be just disguised as a common soldier. Now, Jehoshaphat, you go ahead and put your royal robes on, you know, be, be the king out there. Well, the, the Syrians said, look it, you know, all we got to do is kill Ahab and we're good. So you guys, you, you be sure you find Ahab and kill him. Well, he's disguised. They can't find him. And they start chasing Jehoshaphat. And then he says, me no, me, me no Ahab, me no Ahab, you know. And uh, so they quit chasing him. And it's really interesting. The Bible says some soldier just shot an arrow at random, you know, out there shooting it in the air, and hit Ahab right in the chink of the armor. Mortally wounded. I mean, if, if God can direct a random arrow, do you, th do you think he's got things under control? So that the word of the Lord might be fulfilled. So Ahab's morally wounded and he dies in the chariot and they take the uh, chariot down to the vineyard and they, they wash the blood out of the chariot and the dogs lick the blood of, of Ahab just like Elijah said. Well, Ahab's son, now he's in charge and he's been in the battle and he's kind of wounded so he goes someplace to recover himself and his cousin... Now, who's the, daughter, who's the son of Ahab's daughter being down south? His cousin, the king of, of Judah, he goes up to visit Ahab's son. And this new guy, uh, Jehu, the son of Nimshi, is on, on the, and he's, he's on a mission because he's, he's going to take control. So he finds Ahab's son, and he just shoots him with an arrow through the back. Boom! Dead. You know, the king of Judah, he gets out of there. <clears throat> but Jehu chases him down, shoots him too. See? And uh, so things are going down. Well, the story doesn't end there. The, uh, let's see here. Second Kings, this is a mess here as it works through. Well, I'm looking, I had it marked down, but I just read over the top of it here. Well, anyhow, the daughter's name is Adaliah, okay? And when she finds, or she finds out that, you know, the king of Judah is dead, she goes in and she kills all the royal offspring, her grandkids. She kills all the grandkids to position herself as queen. She's Jezebel's daughter. Kills all the grandkids except one. The, uh, the king's sister, Jehoshabeth, Jehoshabeth, who's also the wife of Jehoiada, the high priest, she takes one of the boys and hides him. <coughs> so there's, the, the king is still there. The lamp of David's not put out. And finally, Adaliah, she gets executed. When, when the boy gets old enough, Jehoiada's got enough power, they make sure that they overthrow Adaliah. But what a, what a rotten piece of history here, introduced by rotten people who really worship in idols and go into the bottom as fast as they can get there. Tremendous message for us. Pay attention to. That's Israel's history. Look at 2 Kings 17. He's going to tell you why Israel fell. King 17, 2 Kings 17, 7. He said, this came about. Okay, Israel was carried away captivity. Known from that point on as the ten lost tribes of Israel. See, I mean, if God wants you out of there, he's out, you're out of there. Empires rise, empires fall. And if God wants you gone as a nation, he's got you gone as a nation. It's in his hands. So Israel's gone. It says, this came about, in verse 7, because the sons of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, who brought them up from the land of Egypt, from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. 
And they feared other gods and walked in the customs of the nations whom God had driven out before the sons of Israel. And in the customs of the kings of Israel, what they introduced. Boy, the house of Omri is right in the middle of that one, isn't it? And the sons of Israel did things secretly, which were not right against the Lord their God. Moreover, they built for themselves high places in all their towns, from watchtower to fortified city. They set up for themselves the sacred pillars and ashram on every high hill and under every green tree. And there they burned incense in all the high places, as the nations did which the Lord had carried away to exile before them. And they did evil things provoking the Lord. They served idols concerning which the Lord had said to them, You shall not do this thing. Yet the Lord warned Israel and Judah through all his prophets and every seer, saying, Turn from your evil ways and keep my command and my statutes, according to all the law which I commanded your fathers, and which I sent to you through my servants, the prophets. However, they did not listen, but stiffened their neck like their fathers, who did not believe in the Lord their God. They rejected his statutes and his covenants, which he made with their fathers, and his warnings with which he warned them. And they followed vanity, became vain, and went after the nations which surrounded them, concerning which the Lord had commanded them not to do like them. They forsook all the commandments of the Lord their God, and made for themselves molten images, even two two calves, and made an Asher, and worshipped all the hosts of heaven, and served Baal. Then they made their sons and their daughters pass through the fire, practiced divination and enchantments, and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him. So the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them from his sight, and none was left except the tribe of Judah. Pretty clear. Idolatry. See, idolatry. Subtle. Destructive. Deceitful. New Testament. If you go to Matthew chapter uh, 6, Matthew chapter 6 and and, uh, verse 24, Matthew 6, 24, Jesus, no one can serve two masters. He will either hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth or you know, literally mammon. Mammon was kind of the, you know, you know, Syriac god of wealth, basically. So, you know, these things are subtle. I mean, we live in an age of a lot of deception. I, I brought with me today, you know, a copy of Humanist Manifesto 1 and Humanist Manifesto 2. Humanist Manifesto 1 was written in uh, 1933. A bunch of guys, including John Dewey, father of modern progressive education, signed it. Um, I think B.F. Skinner signed, you know, the father of modern psychology signed number two. You know, but this is basically worship of self, human, humanism, worship of self. You know, it's my life and I'll do what I want with it, okay? Uh, go for, you know, you only go around this life once, grab for all the gusto you can get, right? Uh, I guess the modern ver- version is that, what, YOLO? You only live once, right? What's that mean? It means go to the bottom as fast as you can get there is what that actually means, isn't it? See, because it takes discipline. It takes, you know, it, it takes mental effort. It, it takes the help of the Lord to really get to where you need to go. A person has to learn to turn aside. You know, Jesus said, uh, if you go to Matthew chapter uh, 16, Jesus is talking there. See, what God's really after is after people who will worship him. And the devil, his goal is to make sure that people worship something else. It's that simple. But that something else, boy, that's subtle. Worship of God's straightforward. Jesus said, he who is not with me is against me. He who does not gather with me scatters. Okay, it's black or white. Which, which side are you on? The devil's got all the gray areas in there, see? In Matthew, 20, or Matthew 16, 24... <coughs> Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. See, when you have a society that's pleasure-driven and thinks the, the world's a playground instead of a battleground, that's really a form of humanism. See, serving self, serving self, serving self. Um, Keeping self happy. See, Jesus is pretty plain. You're going to have to deny self. See, humanism is one of those things that's the opposite 
of, of Christianity, opposite of Jesus Christ. I mean, these guys tell you right up front, you know, they, how, how's this sound here? Um, religious humanists regard the universe as self-existing and not created, right? Humanism believes that man's a part of nature and he's re emerged as a result of continuous process. Holding an organic view of life, humanists find that the traditional dualism of mind and body must re be rejected. In other words, there's not a spirit living within you. You are just a collection of chemicals, folks. It's all you are. There's no spirit within you. There's no battle between the spirit and the flesh. Just follow the flesh because that's all there is. I mean, it's, it's incredibly destructive. You'd be happy to know that the, the uh, Office of Public Instruction basically guarantees to every public school student in the state of Montana a humanist education. Guarantee them. Okay? But it's non-religious, you understand. No. See, the war is going on, and it's, and it's a deceptive war. We have to be on guard. You know, if you go to 1 John chapter 5, it's really interesting here, kind of closing her up today. I mean, those lessons of Ahab, Jezebel, the house of Omri, I mean, they're, they're there uh, for our benefit. So we, we might learn, we might process how our modern, modern idols worship. Covetousness is an idol. Greed is an idol, according to the New Testament. See, they're, you know, they're oftentimes conceptual things have just as much of a power over a person as, as a physical Zeus would. Um, you know, um, games, games on TV, you know, the uh, games that, you know, you play a lot of times, they can be just as addictive as heroin. So you've got you to pay attention to those things. God wants us to. 1 John 5, verse 21. This is how he closes this one. 1 John 5, 21. Little children... Guard yourselves from idols. Why would John say a thing like that in the New Testament? Well, maybe there's somebody here today that you know, like to come out of the darkness into God's marvelous light. Um, you can do so if you know what you're doing. And uh, you know, it's time for you to, to step up and confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Get yourself dunked enough water to do you some good, you know, get your sins forgiven, receive the gift of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Say, you can't, it really can worship and serve God. If that's you, and, and this is your time, uh, you come as we stand. When Jesus said, unless you deny yourself and take up your cross, and follow me. That requires a lot of introspection on our, each of our part. There's nobody, there's no amount of preaching, you know, that can punch a hole in any of our heads. You know, we have to be willing to try to process this and say, okay, where am I at? You know, are there any idols in my life? Is there anything that is more important to me than God? Is there anything more important to me than doing what God wants me to? See, if I have to make a choice... You know, what choice will I make when it's crunch time? See, those, those are things that we have to process because, you know, with the, the church becoming a spiritual temple, then Satan had to move away from physical things to conceptual things to, to counter, counter what God's done. So God really wants us to be in introspection. John, introspective, God, John wasn't kidding when he said, little children, guard yourselves from idols.